I've got only one question. How am I sure that I can trust you? Um, well, we, we, uh, you shouldn't trust me. Uh, we only use open source software. We put on the web uh, the software that we use. You can uh, compile it yourself and then uh, run the system. So we're completely transparent about what we do. Yeah. Don't okay. trust me. <laughs> okay. And then uh, the next gentleman I, I saw was, he just got his hand up there, yeah, with a kind of bluish shirt. And then, yes, okay. you sir, yeah. Hi, so I, I work in web standards. Um, it's really interesting. I actually hadn't heard of AMA before. I was wondering um, whether the intention was that this kind of technology would integrate with uh, browsers directly, you know, software like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, have APIs like the Credential Management API and the Verif Verifiable Claims Standard. Um, but your software seems to sort of sit separately and doesn't integrate with them. I wondered whether there was a reason for that. Um, that's uh, uh, completely right. Well, we have as a point on the horizon had to fix the lack of identity on the internet. And because this is an open uh, infrastructure that can be adapted locally, so in principle, it can be used worldwide. But it needs support indeed. It needs support in the form of plugins to various browsers, email clients, etc. We're working on this. We're talking to some of these parties, indeed, to develop these plugins so that, for instance, if an email message gets signed, uh, then this is shown in your browser simply by some color code or whatever. And you see who signed this, uh, this uh, email. Uh, indeed, it has to be uh, integrated. Because we are open source, we can hopefully also rely on the open source community to, at some stage, integrate this also to, into open office, for instance, uh, so that it can be used for word pro processing, for document processing. And in that context, you can sign documents or authenticate that this document can only be opened by someone with these kind of attributes, etc. That's all possible, but it requires work and it must be integrated. There's nothing in our setup that prevents that. So there's no security in order to essentially open an account. So how, how, is it, how is this really a proof of identity if there's no... Where, where, is, where does the security come in? Oh, where, where's the security? So ultimately, the attributes in your phone are signed by some authority. And it depends on the authority, uh, uh, on the attributes, what the relevant authority is. So your bank account attributes should be signed by your bank digitally. So that whenever you show your bank account on a website, that website can check the signature and can see, oh, this really comes from a bank. So this is, this is basically how it works. Okay. Um, although um, Irma is obviously uh, aimed at um, supplanting traditional authentication, is there any mileage, would it help with the chicken and egg situation if it was, say, integrated with a password management so that people could make it more attractive to users and they could then move from... Uh, traditional password management through to the Irma, the full Irma facility. Cert certainly. Uh, so I've shown an example of a of a medical portal where there are two logins possible on their website, uh, one with username, password, and one with Irma. I think that is the best strategy for most organisations that already have an existing login system. And once sufficiently many people switch to the Irma login, they can drop the the old traditional login. That, that would be a strategy that's not to, up to us to decide because users can do huh? These websites can decide themselves how to integrate this into their products. It's open source. They can do this. And we're not involved as a foundation. Uh, um, what happens when I lose my phone? Uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed this. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> couldn't file my tax returns no. because the Union Revenue wouldn't believe it was me because I couldn't find my phone no. or it was dead. <laughs> no, sure. Two things. Um, um, if the phone gets into someone, el someone else's hands, it can, in principle, not be abused because the app is protected by a pin. If you're, uh, another thing you can do, you can go to the f uh, website of the foundation and block your account. Right? So, so that prevents abuse. But assuming you buy a new phone, <laughs> the way it works at this stage is that you have to recollect your attributes. 
go to all these sources and recollect it. That's a hassle. So we're working on an approach, and actually a student has already implemented a prototype of this, that you can make a backup of your, of your attributes and recover them on, the, on a new phone. That gives more uh, user friendliness, but it's rather subtle how to do this, because if you, you, can, if you don't lose your phone, but simply buy a new one, you may want to move things from your old phone to your new phone, but you want to make sure that your old phone doesn't work anymore. At least Irma on your old phone doesn't work anymore. Because if you can simply hand out copies of your identity, I may be generous and give all my young nephews uh, certain attributes that they can play games, uh, <laughs> etc. So you want to do it in such a way that your old phone is blocked. And, and so we can do it, but we haven't released it yet. Yeah, OK, and over there. Um, hi. By the way, hi. I thought your talk was great. Um, in 10 years' time, do you think we'll have more or less data privacy enforcement? <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, no, I, uh, um, let's say, let's choose the pessimistic option, but then what I like to add to it, I'll die fighting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to fight the good fight. Um, <laughs> I haven't taken a single question from over there yet. Is anybody? Oh, good. Yeah, somebody over there. I'm just trying to really balance this out. So we've been in the middle. We've gone over there. This, this and this is going to be the last <coughs> question, I'm afraid. So this is going to be the zung so humdinger so might finale. Might be a detail, maybe, but I'm curious about the age attribute. Yeah. Uh, how is that can be authenticated? Uh, I can imagine lots of under 18 kids like having just one attribute in their EMI account, which is I'm above 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The way it's a it's a it's a subtle issue. So the way they, uh, the way it works in the Netherlands, so if you go to the municipality and you want to collect some attributes, uh, you get some 20 attributes together, including the fact that you're over 18. Now, what you can do is, of course, in principle, give your phone to someone else and give the PIN code to someone else. Uh, there's nothing against this. <laughs> eh? But what you do also uh, is you give your complete identities to someone else. It's like giving someone else your credit card together with a PIN, which is in generally considered to be not very <laughs> wise to do. So, so uh, the whole thing is protected by combining some valuable and not so valuable attributes. And so, so people are hopefully not inclined to transfer it. But maybe there's someone who will do it eventually. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Right. So we got got through all of that without being hacked by the ghost of Neville Meskelin as well. So that's <laughs> very good news indeed. Um, sorry if we didn't get to, to your question, but hey, hey ho, come along to a future RI event. I'm Gareth Mitchell. But most of all, here's Bart Jacobs. Thanks to him and also for people at the Dutch Embassy for making all this happen. Bart Jacobs, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>